and so now we uh, we have Mark Boyd back uh, after his his uh, his presentation of the report. Uh, so uh, yeah, the goal is to have a, a, a fireside chat uh, with no fire <laughs> uh, uh, there. Um, you know about the report because a lot of things have been shared uh, on the report. We had some questions about you know the geopolitics of open banking. Uh, you know, we had some question about the technical standards that we need to implement. Uh, we, had, we had also some questions about, uh, let's say, the, the potential new business models that are driven. So the goal of this is to uh, have a look up about all these questions that you, we did not have time to address uh, and have a longer discuss discussion with you, Mark, for all the attendees again on Twitter, LinkedIn, Periscope. And um, on um, on Hopin, you can still ask your question. We will uh, be glad to ask them to Mark. So, Mark, first we had a question about the geopolitics of open banking because you were talking about the fact that open banking, you know, is about uh, delivering financial services to everybody, to the rich and the underserved in all the places of the world. But uh, someone was addressing the fact that some countries maybe not about so not the countries but let's say some industries in these countries were not as much as trustworthy than other countries you know like fraud cyber threats uh coming so how today countries which are specifically uh, uh under the threat of cyber attacks or or hacking uh, are addressing the open banking do you have any clue on that yeah uh, and this is why it's so the conference theme is so important i think what I think is really missing from regulations around open banking is we do not have that visibility. We don't have um, clear metrics that are regularly reported in the same way that like anti-money laundering data is regularly reported, you know, and so banks have to announce, you know, what they're doing as far as meeting standards for AML globally, there's fraud reporting, you know, in e-commerce platforms and all of the rest. There's not that there aren't those systems in place yet for open banking. So we cannot see what the level of security risks are globally. Like no, no country that has implemented open banking has a system for explaining fraud. How many times did someone seek to connect an, uh, their bank account to, the, uh, to an app and it was turned down because the bank couldn't see that that was... Um, not a fraud, fraudulent case. We don't know how many of those happens on a monthly basis. So there are really big concerns around the um, the level of security insight and visibility that we've got in open banking um, and open finance ecosystems. The so I'm not sure though about like is, if there's any particular countries or industries where that is more prevalent than others. I think it's just an overall gap. Some of those questions haven't been thought through yet, which is crazy. I mean, like open banking regulations have been in place now for a couple of years, um, like in Europe and so forth, but there aren't the, the, but the regulatory um, reporting and visibility of how the system is working and who is benefiting and who's put at risk isn't, isn't, um, hasn't caught up yet. So it's a great question, yeah. Yeah, because uh, for example, uh, the other question about standards that that we have. So you you show that the Berlin Group is the de facto standards for open banking, at least on account information and payment initiation, who has been the most widely adopted. But there yeah. is also other standards in the banking world or banking driven, like Fido Alliance, for example, about authentication or other like that. So do you think the only way to have a a global trust in open banking anywhere in the world uh, and an open trust uh, because company like Plaid today try to gather all the banks API and be the one-stop shop for all banking. But uh, if we want to have an open ecosystem of uh, banking APIs, we should agree on security protocols. Absolutely. I'm a big, uh, like I'm a big uh, flag waver for open ecosystems, like especially around regulated environments. Like so for, you know, for banking, finance, insurance, uh, healthcare, logistics, port, port um, management, 
uh, uh, transport generally, all of these fields, I think we need open ecosystems that enable any player to enter the market as long as they're showing that they're trustworthy and um, have good systems in place uh, and can meet, you know, industry uh, accreditation and so on. Um, but the and but a, a core enabling factor for open ecosystems are open standards because like I'm a big believer that actually open standards increase security for example because a bespoke solution has only got a small group of people who've been able to test the rigor of the of that approach or of that technology whereas an open standard has got a larger community that's then all kicked the wheels enough to be able to test whether or not that um that technology is fit for purpose. So you're going to get always, and then when it's not, then you've got authorities that are able to then um, add new features, add new security um, recognition. So you so you can mature those sorts of technologies faster. What we find surprising is that when we look at the API documentation, there's really only like, as I was saying, there's only half of the um, uh, banking APIs that are actually saying we do JWT tokens or we do, you know, three factor, uh, two, uh, two factor authentication or whatever. Like there's, there's not any industry wide standards. There's not enough of a discussion of like what standards beyond. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that open API is, um, so prevalent in Europe. It should be more prevalent globally because it helps developers i think it's essential for developer engagement because it helps developers quickly understand what the api is for but there's also now security impacts from op open api because it, they've got like um uh, mtls embedded so the um, business and technical side when they're designing the open api specification can discuss in the specification what the authentication and what the security provisions are for using MTLS. For example, how long certificates are, are, are live for before they are expired, you know, things like that. So standards help help enable that, but I, and I also believe standards are essential for allowing smaller market players to enter um, into industry and be able to compete and offer new products and services as well, rather than trying to understand and build bespoke solution integrations for every single other market supplier that's out there. Yeah, so we had a, a, also another question about the geopolitics of open banking. We have seen many, many regulations come into place. Europe has been really leading on the first innovation aspect. Uh, so beside Europe, which other part of the world are really uh, leading uh, the, um, uh, let's say the open banking um, uh, market and regulations outside their European framework. You know, for example, Australia is following kind of the UK uh, framework or stuff like that, but who is who is uh, having its own independent vision of an open banking beside what Europe is proposing? I like what Brazil's doing, which is, uh, which is sort of leveraging off UK and Europe, but a bit more on the UK side because they are introducing an API standard um, and, and they're not holding back. So they've moved already uh, and they've also got a lot more mandatory products. So that it's not just the payments and accounts. It's also credit scoring, um, uh, credit cards. Uh, I think there's even identity. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of like product categories that are that are on the roadmap for being required to be opened um, by banks, and that with with um, the banks, they are focusing on you know the larger um, segment one and segment two banks in in Brazil. So I think their model is really interesting, and I'm hoping that that will also have a flow on effect to the rest of Latin America. Um, Mexico is quite good because. Again, they've got uh, standards. They've also got an accreditation register in place so you can see which fintech, uh, like Europe, you can see which fintech are able to play in the open banking space because they've already proved their bona fides as far as being um, uh, viable and trustworthy institutions to be able to use open banking. Um, and I love what Indonesia is doing as well because they've put financial inclusion up um, as, as a central goal for their regulation. And you can see that in the moves most recently of the last couple of months from the Bank of Indonesia, really trying to push ahead 
with, um, you know, like how will open banking make a difference for enabling um, banking and financial services for the millions of people who are unbanked across the Indonesian archipelago? Yeah, we had uh, some questions also about the fact that uh, open banking regulations obliged to open mostly two types of its APIs, mostly account information or payment initiation. Uh, but in the, your report, you show that a lot of other API and, and, and capabilities are open. Can you make a little bit of a, of a, of presentation about the, the one that are the most trendy or, or uh, uh, maybe the most uh, um, original ones? Sure. Um, identity is a category that's really growing. So there you see where um, the banks attract, like, and this is, this could actually be a game changer in a lot of countries um, where the banks are enabling um, people to verify their, their identity using their banking data. And then that's enabling the bank to then start moving in towards the whole embedded finance game if they get that right, you know, sort of thing. Um, that to me it makes sense for banks in some ways because um, of the because your 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 identity is trusted with a bank um, and they've got the reputation where you would hope that the identity uh, that they can provide those sorts of identity services so I think that's interesting I mean that's not going to take off in an area like France for example that has a really strong government uh, French identity API Singapore's got that as well and in fact in Singapore it's worked reverse. So when the banks use the Singapore government's identity API, the bank is able to then more quickly offer loans or new account opening to customers because they're able to verify via the government API. So I think either government or bank API. So I think that's interesting. I love what some of the credit scoring is doing um, around um, those who have limited, uh, limited proof of credit um, and therefore the and therefore can't get a financing loan but they're able to show they pay their bills on time they pay their rent on time their transactional history actually shows that they are um, reliable customers and then that's being used then as the credit score so I'm loving that and also with the apis it's much more contemporary a lot of the large credit companies uh, uh, credit scoring companies Experian and so on they use like old data it might be like six months old or a year old you know to be able to give you your credit score so these transactional apis if you're a new business or a new merchant you can very quickly show that you are deserving or or, or reliable enough for a you know small business financing loan and all the rest so so credit scoring i would say um and then uh so they're the two ones that i like i mean there are trading is huge at the moment that everyone's going into trading um i i don't really care about trading <laughs> but like it's yeah it's happening there i guess it lets more people get involved in that um game if that's if that's your bag so um so there's a bit of that as well i think i would I, i'd like to see a bit more in in real estate i'm not sort of seeing that sort of um stuff at the moment Yep, and it still takes uh, uh, days or weeks to get an approval from real estate agents uh, for a mortgage or something like that. So the thing is, uh, we're in APIs New York, and uh, you know the FCC and and the Federal um, uh, Trade Commission too uh, are are looking about regulation in the U.S. Uh, right. So what can you? What do we know? currently about future regulation about open banking involving APIs in the US? I think there's two key things here that's happening in the US to keep an eye on. One will take a little bit longer, I think, and that's the um, uh, consultation period that ended in February with the um, uh, CFPB, Consumer... Uh, <laughs> um, and, then, and that's looking at how do you introduce open banking regulations uh, for the exchange of data um, across different systems uh, in the banking and financial system. And I think, you know, there were some really solid responses that were put in around that by a number of players. And I think that will lead to some policy making that will take a bit longer, maybe Q3 um, this year at the earliest, but, you know, probably more likely even next year for, for some of that to come through. What I think I'm more excited about as far as 
a driver is the executive order that came out of the White House last week with their, or two weeks ago now, where they put out a, an executive order around um, increasing competition. And one of the, the final element of that executive order is that um, banks are required to enable data portability for clients, so for customers, for bank customers. So if you want to take your bank data from one bank and move it to another bank, you should be able to have be able to do that easily. You know, so that so that means machine readable systems. So the, hopefully, I th you know, like even if the rest of the discussions and the regulation, and when we've seen this globally, the first level for the um, for global regulation is banks push back. So in Australia, I think like the Australia, for example, when they started on this, all the banks got together and signed a thing saying, we don't want Apple Pay, you know, <laughs> like they were like, they were just pushing back on every element of um, the banking uh, of new of open finance, you know, and open banking. And so I think we're going to see that in the US as well. And so just because that's the rule book, book that the banks are sharing globally, you know. So I think in, while that's happening, the data portability will be the entry into um, enabling um, better data sharing. And US needs it. Like at the moment, there's still far too much screen scraping that's occurring across um, different services. Um, there's far too many apps that are sort of just like the mobile one-off app that requires all of that screen scraping or for you to re-enter your data into the, the app before you can actually get a good picture of your financial health. So if you're able to use your bank switching rights and your data rights there to be able to access that data, then that's, that, I think that's going to have a, a bigger impact in the shorter term. So we have a question from uh, one uh, freelancer uh, who is uh, who, here who asks, like, how, what would be your advice um, as a freelancer on open banking to embedded finance to integrate its feature to monetize the digital app website with it? So, like, let's say today, just imagine you are one of the freelancer app developer or a fintech, whatever, uh, startup uh, founder. Where do you see, like, some uh, opportunities into, like, uh, of course, there is no cheap or low-hanging fruit opportunity they're already taken. But to your mind, what if you had, uh, if you had time and, and, and resources, what would be the fintech app you would build? I think there is a ton of opportunity, actually. I don't think that anyone is doing enough on the segmentation. And I cut, my favorite story around this is Snag Tights. So Snag Tights is a Scottish business owned by a woman um, who, who global market for tights is like in the billions, you know? And she had a really great business model. It was awesome. It was building up value. Then along came COVID. So she tried to get a bank loan to be able to cover three months while people stopped buying because they were worried about what was going to happen next. So she couldn't get the bank loan. Even though she had proven this fast track growth from her customer market who was loyal and was repeat business in an industry that was globally growing and yet still she couldn't get that sort of funding. Um, and that, so then she went to her customer base and said, let's do this two for one, where you buy two pairs of tights now, we'll send you one now, but we won't send you the other one until September, you know, and this was in March. So, the, and that was how they got the financing to be able to see them through the rough patch. They, they saw explosive growth, you know, from that. Why isn't there a fintech solution that is able to offer that? Like, you know, and women-owned businesses were one of the biggest hit by COVID because they have caring responsibilities they didn't have access to this financing they you know like so i think any mark any fintech that is looking at you know and but they're reliable businesses that are that have great customer base have really strong um loyalty and who are doing really diverse and interesting product stuff so you know like anything that you would focus on that market i think would be huge and that there's a desperate need for it. Um, the in today in ProPublica in the US, there was a report about um, co-ops who weren't able to access the small business um, assistance loans in the US during um, COVID. I, again, the you know the ProPublica article has got some great data points about the growth and the model, but banks and existing systems don't understand the cooperative model. 
because you know it's like diversified ownership so you can't um put all risk in one person and just you know and, and be able to credit score for that so there's a whole bunch of like the, so you know digging into that field no one's touching that field that's a great fintech opportunity there you know they uh, i could go on there's there's a whole bunch um that's really option but i think the the answer is like go back to the customer segmentation and have a look at that sort of stuff. Then the other, from the embedded finance, just finally on that one, I've always thought like, why not like something like, you've got Canva, InDesign, all of that sort of stuff, um, uh, Net Forest, I think, anyway, Theme Forest. Anyway, so all of those have like, um, so you've got your design app or whatever. And then I think they're starting to get like, you know, platforms where you could get um, a designer to help you use Canva to build you know, your logo or whatever. But imagine if that was the full loop. So one, you could actually find, so one, you can subscribe to Canva and you've got that as your design app. Now for a specific project, you can find a freelancer who can help you build with that um, on your Canva and then you've got it in future and you can adapt to it. Then on top of that, what if you could do your invoicing through that as well? And it's all sorted out. You know, like if that sort of embedded finance and pay the pay your freelancers as well. So you could have that whole customer journey mapped out inside your app. And then you go to Canva, then you go to InDesign or whatever, and you sell that as an add-on, just like the Intuit invoicing apps used to do. Or, you know, there's some Stripe apps that are for invoices um, and they've taken off and Stripe ends up buying them, you know, to be able to offer that as a feature within their core product so you know so there's all of those available i think in embedded finance that are still unexplored if you map out that customer journey yeah well we have actually one uh, female speaker at 4 20 p.m uh eastern time who is the ceo of goldex she she delivered apis on top of companies who used to do uh, um, gold minting you know they were not they were just physical companies selling physical gold but you know, with all these decentralized finance aspect and everything, so she completely uh, transformed their uh, their physical logistics into IT enabled logistics with an API that acts that when you can actually order gold to be a, to be able to be traded uh, for people who wants to uh, to to buy some gold. So yeah, there is opportunity everywhere. Uh, you know, even bringing gold into into the uh, like physical gold into 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 trading. Uh, whatever we think about trading. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, a lot of our opportunities there. So we have one more minute, uh, uh, Mark. So my, my, my last question will be about, yeah, regulation coming to the game. When do you think, at least, because you, you work with banking, but also you know about healthcare, when company will go beyond regulations? Is it already happening or is it, we're not there yet? In the banking space? Yes, in the banking space. Yeah. Um, then look, I I think um, so. This year, I think there has been a shift. Um, I think I, I think it'll be like let's say middle of next year. Let's say this time next year, we'll be talking about how more banks are ready to be serious about this game and be looking at new business models and all of the rest. So you, this year, I've seen a change. It's definitely their interest. They they see that there's value now in the partnerships. Um, I think that it'll, it'll, that we'll start to see some front runners pull ahead and then that will wake up the rest of the players and they'll sort of, you know, then there'll be a second um, genera you know, second um, set that will start to be more serious about this and we'll, we'll see some um, real innovation over the next year. But I think this time next year we'll be saying that's an emerging trend. Yeah, if we don't have any more uh, global pandemic <laughs> well, surprises. We've got, global, we've got climate crisis to handle next. <laughs> and climate crisis coming, uh, yeah, uh, middle of next year. So yeah, maybe we'll reinvite you in the middle of next year and see if the your predictions were, were right. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh,